Joining me this morning is Maitha Al Hassan, good friend of mine, and she's here to talk to us about her story that's in the book "I Speak for Myself," which was number two on the Huffington Post top eleven recommended best religious books for 2011, which came out in mid December of 2011. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Yes, Ah, I'm excited too. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so let's get into it. I don't know much about. Mm Islam or Muslim culture, but I definitely hear a lot about what's happening in the news and how there's all these issues of like identity and religion and like terrorist attacks. And, you know, it's hard for anyone to try to comprehend like the realities. What can you tell me about that? Well, you know, what's interesting. It's kind of sad that this day and age, almost a decade after 9-11, that when we talk about Islam or Muslims, we're talking about it in a framework of hate, you know, whether or not it's political campaigns that use Islamophobic is what they call it, Islamophobic rhetoric as a platform for people to vote for them or to galvanize a different group of people to support them. Um, We this is what we're talking about now. And I say it's unfortunate because there is a beautiful history of Islam not only in the world, the way that it built up, like the south of Spain. We'll talk about that mm-hmm. maybe a little bit later. Um, but also Islam in America has a long history. I mean, I could go on talking about some of the innovators in American history that were Muslim. Mm-hmm. And especially like jazz musicians and basketball players that people know and love. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar um, and some actors and actresses that people also know and love that profess to be Muslim. Um, you know, the the basic thing about Islam that I think people don't know is that it's part of the Abrahamic faiths. So it sees itself coming out of Judaism, Christianity, and then Islam comes to the scene. So basically all the prophets that are in the Old and New Testament are prophets that Muslims also worship and honor. Wow. And, you know, religion is such a, a taboo topic. It's one of those things that people say, well, don't talk about politics. Yes. Don't talk about religion. Which we're going to do today because we're just controversial that way. But it's definitely something that people, um, I don't think, recognize that the two are combined. Yes. Well, it's interesting because we always talk about the separation of church and state, separation of church and state. And I see that and I understand that history in our American political legacy. But we also always talk about, oh, our Constitution is informed by Judeo-Christian history and text and culture. So why not think about the ways that it, Islam also informs it? You know, we a lot of people don't know that Benjamin Franklin had a Quran. That's what um, a congressman, a Muslim, Muslim congressman, his name is Congressman Ellison, he took the congressional oath on Benjamin Franklin's Quran. Wow. Yes, Benjamin Franklin was not Muslim, but he found it important to read of all the great faiths which is what our founding fathers did. And, I, you know, mm-hmm. a lot of that history is hidden. So in this book, I speak for myself, which is American Women on Being Muslim. Mm-hmm. And you're also a doctoral student at USC. Go Trojans. <laughs> I'm rocking out my USC Trojan sweater right now. It's and- so convenient of you. <laughs> <laughs> but no hoops. And I'm asking why you're not. No, but you have the hoop earrings. I am. I'm representing you're for the rep- Latinas. <laughs> and I'm not Latina, but... I like, come from West Covina. You're from West Covina, so you may as well be. And the way that your photo is on the cover of this book, I, I mean, you're rocking the hair, you got the big old hoop earrings, you got a flannel shirt on, <laughs> you know? Let's get into this book then. So here you write, you're write. you writing about um, Arab identity. And after 9-11, you, uh, you and your father had a conversation, right? And so mm-hmm. your dad was concerned about your safety. Yes. And so you you write, I don't look Arab. Everybody here thinks I'm Mexican. You thought to yourself, I'm lucky no one thinks I look Arab. And in the middle of, of that thought, you experienced lucky. I should not have to hide my Arabness. Who cares what anybody thinks about me? I am Arab. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about that? Yeah. You know, what's interesting. Um, we talked about religion being taboo. What is also interestingly taboo is being Arab. I found that a lot. I found that um, growing up, although West Covina now is very demographically diverse, it was very difficult for me to admit that I was Arab. It was actually easier for me to be Muslim because in schools we talked about different religions and we even studied Islam, the Islamic golden age. But there was ex- exceptional silence on 
being Arab. So uh, this is where I'm going to be totally and, and quite frankly, very honest and candid and personally say I don't know what the difference is. OK, well, that's great. Okay. I mean, we can let's start. Let's back up. OK, so this is the way that I explain it. Actually, most of the Arabs in the U.S. are Christian. And there is a lot of religious diversity in the Arab world. There's Arab Jews. There's Arab Christians. There's Arab Muslims. Islam was founded in what we know of as Saudi Arabia right now, Mecca, Medina, those cities. So it was founded during a time when there were Arabs there. So that's why it becomes continually associated with Arab culture. But those are not one and the same. Arabs are an ethnicity. They're be- in throughout history, they've become like a nationality. And so is Arab like saying like you're me- like Mexican American? Yes. Yeah. I mean, the, or Argentinian American or like, well, Argentinian would be something like saying, so I'm, my parents are from Syria. It would be saying that we're, you're Syrian. So, uh-huh. so the equivalent would be like Latino okay. is being that, Arab because you share a certain culture and you share a certain language. But within that, there are different breakdowns. Right. Exactly. Okay. The oh. different countries are the different breakdowns, but the idea of being Arab has changed throughout history. But you know, right now it includes the Middle East and North Africa. There are actually more Arabs on the African continent than in the Middle East. And people don't know about that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So, wow. so being Muslim, the most, the country with the most Muslims in the world is Indonesia. And they're not an Arab country, you know? Okay. So it's something for us to all think about. And most of the Muslims in the U.S. are African-American. Arabs are probably the third most represented group in terms of Islam in America. Wow. And so how does that play within your identity? And then after 9-11 and all the, the fear mongering and hate speech that we've heard throughout media and throughout politicians and, you know, just in general. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's always this fear of the unknown. So it always becomes convenient to link up Islam and Arabs because it, it makes it even more foreign. Right. Yeah. Even though there are really interesting Arab Americans out there who people don't even know are Arab, but they still love them. Like Salma Hayek is half Lebanese. And well, she, she would be considered half Arab? Yeah. Because oh, she's, yeah. Because she's Lebanese. Yeah. Her, uh-huh. her ancestry is Lebanese. And Shakira, who we all know and love, uh-huh. is half Lebanese, too. And she takes ownership of her Arab lineage more than, let's say, like a Salma Hayek would. Yeah. Especially uh, in her early career as a musician, her, her early music had that influence, I right. would say. Ojo Sassi has uh-huh. Arabic in it. Yes. My dad loves that. Thing, <laughs> oh, my dad. My, my dad is also a closet Mexican, by the way. His favorite. His, one of his favorite movies is Salina. And another one of is course. La Bamba. Of course. Those are staples in Latino culture here in the U.S. <laughs> and he has he has more um, Latino friends than he does Arabs. So I've been I've been raised with like so many different cultural t- traditions. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like that's the experience of truly being American, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to go back to your initial question, I think there's a multiplicity of identities that are happening. And so my story talks about me trying to understand each one. So it's almost like I had a linear experience with them. Like I was really about being Muslim early on because it meant that I could distance myself from being Arab because being Arab was so foreign. There were like only two other Arabs in my school that didn't have my same last name and they all disavowed being Arab. One pretended that she was Turkish and the other one never claimed it. So all of this journey, all of these experiences, you growing up uh, in West Covina, rocking the hoop earrings, (laughs) you know, and and you're obviously your your love of hip hop and music and culture has brought you to this point. Now you're studying this particular issue at USC. Tell us about what that's like for you. So um, I've written a lot, actually, about hip hop and Islam and hip hop and Arabs and all these cultures that I was very fascinated by. Because, like, if you look at hip hop music, you find a strong Islamic influence. Journalist Harry Allen in 1991 called Islam the unofficial religion of hip hop. Really? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Early on in 1991, because what was happening a little before and during that time period was that hip hop was being very informed by um, people who were part of the nation or who were really down with Louis Farrakhan. 
You know, right. like you had you had Public Enemy, P.E., Chuck D., like constantly repping the nation, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, you had the nation of gods and earth bodies, what we know of as 5% movement, like really bringing it when it comes to like Islamic references, like Wu-Tang. All the members of Wu-Tang are pretty much 5%ers. And what that... What does that mean? So 5%ers is this branch of the nation of Islam that is broken off from the nation. They're kind of like... I, I hate to give labels, and especially since I'm not part of the 5% movement, they see themselves as, like, guess, a more mystical branch of the nation. They still take their lessons, but they're very, um, they're very like, abstract about certain things and creative with the way that they break down language and the way they break down numerology. Like, for example, in the 90s, there's this hip-hop song by Eric B. and Rakim called Know the Ledge. That's breaking down knowledge. Oh, okay. And What Up G... You know how folks yeah, are like, yeah, what up, yeah. G? And they think it means, what up, gangster? Yeah. It actually means, what up, God? Because they, Get out of here. Really? Yes. And that came from the 5% nation. And that's wow. them recognizing the God in you. Wow. You're dropping some knowledge <laughs> today, girl. Well, that, that's <laughs> drop, dropping knowledge and dropping science is from the 5% movement. Get out of here. Really? I didn't know that I was a 5%. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> You so, got to do a little bit more than that, yeah, then drop no, it. Drop some knowledge, I know. And but, say what up, G, obviously. But there, there's some really interesting books about this. There's this book by, actually, I think this Japanese-American woman. She's an ethnomusicologist, and she wrote this book investigating five percenters, and she looked at all the lyrics and explains the way they break things down, the way they break down numerology. Like, the number seven is super important mm-hmm. in um, five percent philosophy or like they call themselves more so the nation of gods and earth bodies. Erica Badu references a lot, it a lot too. I could go on forever. Really? Yeah, who's part of the five percenters or down with the five percenters. You never would have thought, you know. I think it's it's kind of like unconscious. And even Riza has that book out, The Tao of Wu. Yeah. And is that in any in any form? Riza's interesting. Riza combines uh, or studies a lot of traditions, I should say. Mm-hmm. He studies Taoism. He studies uh, chess. Like, really deep into chess. Chess is in the game? Yes. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Wu-Tang is so deep into chess. Wow. You never would have thought. Yeah. My guest this morning is May Al-Hassan, who is a journalist, writer, doctoral student at USC. And she's here speaking to us about what it is like to be a woman Muslim in America. And then, you know... And, and am I right in saying that? Do you identify now with just, you know, I am Muslim or I am Arab? Like, what do you say? You know, it's interesting because um, I keep on saying it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> because it is interesting. <laughs> um, this book came out in 2011 and I wrote my entry in 2008. That's sometimes how long the book process takes. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I see myself as Muslim, but more so I see somebody who I see myself as somebody who practices Islam. And what I mean by that is Islam translated means it's been translated in many different ways, but surrendering to peace. And it's the, for me, the practice of trying to figure out how to surrender to peace. Muslim is a noun, meaning somebody who submits or is submitting. And I feel like that's a lot, you know, like for me to claim that I'm submitting constantly. So I've been yeah. thinking. Yeah. So I <laughs> talk about consciousness of words, right? Word choice. Yeah. And that's what I love about Arabic. Um, is that it, if people were very familiar with Arabic, it's a really poetic language. And actually, the Quran rhymes a lot. Wow. Yeah. The holy book um, that the Muslims turn to is, um, is the Quran, and it's written in Arabic. And it's been translated in every language on the face of the planet. But the original text is in Arabic, and it actually does rhyme. And, you know, some, some hip-hop artists have said that's what's drawn them to the Quran, because they see, like, the, the love of the rhyme scheme. Even, I think most deaf had an interview because, you know, he's Muslim. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, where he talks about how beautiful the, the rhyming is on the opening verse, uh, the opening um, chapter. Throughout your research on identity, religion, and the influence of Islam within hip-hop music, what is the one thing that you walk away with? The, the crazy part about hip-hop and Islam is that you might be a fan of hip-hop music and not even know the significant impact that Islam has had on hip-hop, even straight with the lyrics. Um, for example, you have like Lauren Hill, who on her song Doo-Wop talks about um, that thing, thing, that, that thing. thing, that thing. Yo, 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 
my men and my women, don't forget about the dean. This is not the most the king, yo. And she she says, yo, my men and my women, don't forget about the dean, Sarata Mustaqim. And dean means religion. And that's what a lot of people in the Muslim American culture used to talk about. Hey, yo, are you on your dean? Are you on your religion? Meaning, are you staying up, you know, right with um, with being righteous? Wow. And Sarat Mustaqim means the path means like the middle path and that's frequently used in the Quran and Muslim American culture to talk about being on the path or the right path. So that's straight from yeah. old school Lauren Hill. Yeah. And we all miss her too and wish she would come back. Yeah. And even one of her songs I can't remember from off the top of her head is almost a direct translation of the first chapter of the Quran. She translates like the she just wraps the English version of it. And there's so many other artists like we were talking about Wu Tang, which does a lot of uh, breaking down in the vein of like the five percenters, um, the nation, people who were repping the nation in the late 80s, early 90s, like public enemy. And also we can think about most deaf. He starts out almost all his albums saying Bismillah, which means in the name of God. Wow. And sometimes people continue that with Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, in the name of God, the most beneficent, the most merciful. And you were also talking about Lupe Fiasco. Lupe Fiasco. Akon. Lupe Fiasco even has a song that is a response to Kanye West's song, Jesus Walks, called Muhammad Walks. Abraham talk, Muhammad talk, and Moses split the sea. I ain't trying to profit off the profit, so this one here's for free. Uh, G's up, yeah. along with Muhammad and Jesus. In the Quran, they call him Isa. Don't think Osama and Saddam is our leader. We pray for peace, but the drama intrigues us all. So we fall for the illusions of the beast. So instead of trying to teach, you show our teeth. When you Google Muhammad Walks, the first thing that comes up is a YouTube version of the song crediting Lupe Fiasco and saying, I wanted to flip Jesus Walks when it first came out and I did it in a record called Muhammad Walks because I'm Muslim. And so I flipped it from a Muslim perspective. Lupe Fiasco is just a very obvious example because he uses all these Islamic reference all over his music. And it's and you his, had a chance to interview Lupe Fiasco I did some time actually. ago. What was yeah. that like? Um, well, it was a Skype interview uh, so very much of the technology of our age it was great because what I my role was to field questions from Twitter and Facebook so I didn't personally get a chance to ask him questions but people were really interested on his position in the Occupy movement because very early on he was aligning himself and supporting the movement by like retweeting also giving tents to the occupiers in New York so that was interesting. What I did learn is he's involved in not just only Muslim social issues, because he is an outspoken advocate for Palestine and for other Muslim quote unquote causes. Muslim. <laughs> like but that. but he also he's also a big time advocate of Tibet. I would have not known that unless some until somebody from Twitter asked me that question to ask him what his stance on was on Tibet and he pulls out some prayer beads and he said these are prayer beads from Tibetan Buddhism. And that's what wow. he was wearing around his neck. And he's definitely a very avowed Muslim, but, you know, he sees him con himself connected to all these social struggles globally. And another person, which some of your listeners might know, is Akon. Akon is Senegalese. Most of the population of Senegal is Muslim, and he does. He has made references about being Muslim in his music. Jurassic 5, local Los Angeles band, a lot of their members are Muslim. The Roots, some of the members even have Islamic names. And then House band to Jimmy Fallon. Oh, yeah, they are the house band mm -hmm. to Jimmy Fallon. I completely forgot mm -hmm. about that. I just love them in their own <laughs> right, not just because Jimmy Fallon is... That's how I was introduced to The Roots, through Jimmy Fallon. Are you serious? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, they've been around for a while, part of this whole 90s music movement that was happening. I guess people would call it like conscious hip hop movement, but they're still lasting. And mm -hmm. they make, I heard their last album was great. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, it is. It is. It, yeah, no, it still <laughs> is. And I need to be on it. Uh, Goody Mob has a song called Inshallah, which is very obvious. God mm -hmm. willing. And they, God willing. God willing. Inshallah. Yeah. And then there's also, again, just like Lauren Hill, direct translation from the Quran in English and might be lost to a lot of the listeners if they're not familiar with that. Uh, we just think it's a remix of some sort. Yeah, <laughs> a remix. Or not, not even like they'll just rap it in English, not even in Arabic, but they're just doing the English translation of the Arabic text in the Quran. 
Wow. So they're saying like the most merciful, all praises due to the most merciful, the most high. And that's how we start off reciting a chapter. We always say that before each chapter. So again, I could go on forever. I have my little iTunes list in front of me and I'm just pulling up this playlist I have of Islam and hip hop. You have Jill Scott, you have Akon, Lupe Fiasco. But they're not, but they're not, yeah, Black Most Star. Def, Tupac, Fuji's, Jurassic 5, The Roots. So the influence of, of Islam in hip hop is prevalent. It's there. It's right in front of our face, in our ears. In our ears. And we may not even know it. We may not even know it. And it's sometimes also by artists who are not necessarily Muslim, but they're exposed to the culture. So the culture is there. Thank you, May. Thank you so much, Wendy, for having me on. This has been beyond fantastic. My guest today, May Al-Hassan, who is a writer and journalist covering the world of hip-hop and Muslim communities. She is continuing her work as a PhD student at USC, disturbing the status quo with her big hoop earrings. More on that in our next series of interviews with May on culture, identity, politics, and the increase of young people converting to Islam. Her personal story on Arab and Muslim identity can be found in the book, I Speak for Myself, American Women on Being Muslim. It was ranked number two on the Huffington Post's Best Religious Books of 2011. The list came out in mid-December of 2011. You can learn more about her on her website, mayalhassen.com. That's M-A-Y-A-L-H-A-S-S-E-N.com. I'm Wendy Carrillo, and this is Knowledge is Power on Power 106. A podcast of this show will be available on my blog at power106.com. I'll also post a link on my Twitter, so be sure to follow me at twitter.com slash Wendy Carrillo.